heard of Jean Royce, she admitted me. And there were so many people here who treated me wonderfully well. McNeil, who got me into debating. Norman Miller, whose daughter I am looking at this very moment. A wonderful, the greatest professor of mathematics I ever knew, invited me to their Christmas dinners. So many good people, suddenly here I was simply another human being. And then, of course, I could say to Ralph, to Ralph Emanuel, why? Everything, of course, has some drawbacks. I have a woman that I consider the finest wife any man can have. It's her birthday today. And <laughs> Isabel is basically a shy person. And so she was very worried about all this publicity. But how can you buy a castle and not have reporters <coughs> ferret out your name? Too many people have to know. I'm reminded of the second chapter of the book of Job. Shall we take the good from God and not the bad? And of course, there's also the very serious problem. When you help a university to buy a castle like this, what can we do for an encore? <laughs> but I must tell you with Isabel's vision, and if the good Lord gives us the good health that we have now, we'll find other great things to do with our money which we certainly don't want to spend, and which we certainly cannot take with us. And now having, uh, having talked about Hurstman Sue, let me talk to you briefly about business. Business in North America. It seems to me that there are at least three things in American business which are fundamentally flawed. And it seems to me also that if you had a really good grasp in liberal arts, and if then you go into business, you could help to cure these flaws. The one is the tremendous importance which businessmen put on the image. Companies spend billions advertising that they are really good and often very little on superb service. I'm sure you've heard this ugly story of a customer complaining and the vice president saying to a clerk, send the bastard form letter number 37. It happens all too often. The customer isn't always right. But every customer is a human being, and every customer is entitled to being answered individually, being taken seriously. And so many companies don't do that. The second flaw in American business is this enormous importance given to the next bottom line. What will the next quarter's earnings be? Frankly, it doesn't really matter whether the earnings of the next quarter are 10% or 15% or 20%, what really matters is what the company will be doing five or 10 years from now. But so many businessmen are so scared of stock analysts. God forbid the earnings will be down 
two cents a share from predictions and the stock will drop. Unlike many American businessmen, I do not admire the Japanese. And if there are any Japanese here, I hope that you will forgive me and understand. I don't like the Japanese lifestyle. Why, their homes are tiny. You couldn't possibly hang any old master paintings in those tiny homes. It can't be done. But I do admire the Japanese for three things. In business, many of them are very honest people, very reliable people. But more important, they have a long-term vision of business. The next quarterly report is not that important. And most important, there's a loyalty in Japanese companies, loyalty between employers and employees. The third flaw in American business is the deification of bigness. There are so many mergers, not because the products will get to be any better, not because the employees or the customers will be better off, but only because of the egos of the executives involved. What we've seen in American companies, and I'm sure I'm afraid in Canadian companies also, this terrible spectacle of managers, executives, making a million dollars or more a year, and yet laying off thousands of employees. Every layoff is a personal trauma. It is shocking to the individual involved. And yet, it is very seldom that the executives who are, have shown poor management are in any way <coughs> penalized. Only the employees, you have this terrible word, downsizing, letting people go. The deification of business, mistaking great wealth for happiness. I can ask myself very easily, would I be any happier if I was twice as wealthy as I am? And the answer is certainly no. I know what would make me a great deal unhappier, loss of my family, loss of my friends, loss of our good health. This deification of business is truly ugly. And I believe that a person who has really studied and enjoyed great literature would understand all that and would, would really make a better businessman. My friends speak of the ABC of my life, the art, the Bible, and the chemistry. How I came to art, I've told you, how I've come to chemistry, I will talk about tomorrow noon in the chemistry department. How I came to the Bible was a bit more circuitous. As a boy, we had neighbors in our house, very good people, Orthodox Jews who invited me to their Sabbath meals and their Passover meals. And to me, the finest Nights in the year were the two nights of Passover with all those long discussions about the exodus from Egypt. But I don't remember actually looking at the Bible until I was 14 and I went to a synagogue school in England. And then in the prisoner war camp, I studied the Bible 
very closely. And it's a wonderful book. You know, when I hear now in synagogue once a year, Moses' farewell speech, for this commandment which I command you this day, it isn't far off. It isn't in heaven that you should say, who will go to heaven for us and bring it unto us that we may do it? And it is not beyond the sea, and you shall say, who will go beyond the sea for us to bring it unto us? But the word is very close to you, in your mind and in your heart, that you shall do it. It's almost as if I was hearing Moses himself truly inspiring. And if I worry about what is happening in the Middle East, I look at that short book, the Book of Ruth, four chapters. It should really be called the Book of Naomi. It's a wonderful book about this wonderful Israeli woman, Naomi, and her daughter-in-law, a Jordanian woman, Ruth. The love between these two women, a Jordanian and an Israeli. And suddenly, I have hope. Surely it's no accident that out of the marriage of Ruth the Jordanian and Boaz, the man of Judah, came David, King David, and therefore the Messiah, a Jordanian and in Israeli, there is hope. Or I can look, as I do often, at the book of Amos. Wonderful language. Truly moving, inspiring language. That just as well forth as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream, and look at the last sentences in Amos, and you will see what is happening in Israel today. It's uncanny. It is beautiful. Look at the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. You shall not put a stumbling block before the blind the most important commandment for business. Treat your customers decently. Don't mislead them. You shall not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. The key commandment for civil rights. You know, it is only a liberal arts education that will make students think about the most important question which there really is in life. Why are we here? If we're here just by accident, then of course the answer is, heck, we should just have a wonderful time and be off. Make the best we can and that's it. I don't believe this is so. You know, politicians from all parties spout all sorts of things about democracy. But why, why democracy? Wouldn't an elitist government be much more efficient? You all know that there are some people that are far more intelligent than others. There are some people that are far stronger than others. Many of you can beat me up easily. Why not an elitist government? Well, only if you truly think about it and believe in God. Believe that there is some of God in each of us. Only if you truly believe that will you say that everyone should have the right to the same opportunity. Only if you believe that. Only if you think about it. And the liberal arts education will lead you to thinking about it.